Hi, good afternoon. I'm impressed with your stamina. You know, the graveyard slot. So thank you uh, for staying. Huge pleasure to be uh, back in Singapore and with the wonders of modern technology. My Mac's over here and the button's here. Let's see if it works. OK. Antibiotics, friend or foe? Well, we're told they work. Who believes? A few, not everybody. Oh. So you're either asleep or you're not sure. Um, on the right, there's this wonderful uh, thing from Tom Bleck, who's a neurointensivist in, he's now in Chicago, um, where he talks about, oh, sorry, can you go back one? Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Thank you. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, evidence bias, medicine and religion. And I, I think, unfortunately, I think the antibiotic story is a bit clouded by religion and uh, hope. So Alexander Fleming gave Harry Lambert, who was suffering from uh, streptococcal meningitis, um, intrathecal penicillin, and he was the first recorded survivor. August 1942, and you can see there, this is his TPR chart at St. Mary's Hospital in London. But penicillin wasn't the first antibiotic. This is uh, from Birmingham. 1938, they gave a trial of M and B, May and Baker, 693. It's a sulfonamide antibiotic. They treated 200 cases of lobar pneumonia, and many of them they actually showed, proved they were pneumococcal, so poor prognosis cases. And depending on which day of the week you came into hospital, you were randomized. If you were under Drs. Evans and Gainsford, you got the treatment. If you came in on the wrong day of the week, you didn't. It's randomization. And if you look at the outcomes, those who got the sulfonamide, on an average, they got about three days of treatment. You can see here, it reduced the mortality down to 8% from 27%. But look at the control group. 73% of the patients got better with essentially nothing. There was not intensive care. They may have got some oxygen, they may have got some fluid, but essentially they were put in a bed. But most of them got better. Um, in 1940, this came out from Manchester, where essentially they tried to replicate the trial, and they continued the antibiotic for 24 hours after the temperature had fallen to normal, and restarted it if the temperature rose again. And they also found an improvement in mortality. Again, different types of pneumococcus going down from 78 patients 21 deaths in the control group, 119 down to eight. Again, good outcomes. But they made the point that the patients who survived didn't get better any quickly, any more quickly, I should say, with the antibiotics. And in some cases, it may have been delayed. Another group, sorry, can you go back one? Sorry. Well, Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. you were too quick on the draw. Um, but they also noted that another group had also commented on the fact their patients weren't so bright after the treatment as with a natural crisis. And they'd found the same. Let's go a little bit further back in time. 1935, Dr. Gamble from Greenville, Mississippi, and rather scarily, all of these were treated at the White King's Daughters Hospital. Thank God we've moved on from that. But he reports his practice of treating white patients in this hospital for about 30 odd years. And these are patients he found, well, I'll talk about the series later, but these are patients with essentially necrotizing fasciitis. They called it emphysematous gangrene. We now call it necrotizing fasciitis of the abdomen, which is a pretty serious condition. And you can see in his series, six lived and six died. I've shown eight of them. And some died that had renal failure, some spreading uh, 
you know, gangrene, etc. But the fact was, six lived just purely with surgery, debridement, irrigation, etc. It's a good old-fashioned basic surgery. And he also, in uh, this paper, reported his series, 490 operations on the biliary tract, only eight deaths. 292 cases of appendicitis being drained, 141 openly with no gangrene, no deaths, 151 with drainage and partial closure, five gangrene, three deaths, and of 292 drainage cases, 82 cases of generalized peritonitis. All were treated in this manner. None developed a severe wound infection. None died. Pretty good going for generalized peritonitis, isn't it? Even earlier back in time, 1897, Andrew McCosh in New York, he noted earlier that basically he got very bad outcomes from his cases of general septic peritonitis. 86% mortality. Only six patients recovered out of uh, 43. He then changed his approach to do debridement, lavage, drainage, and he also believed in uh, giving magnesium sulfate into the bowel at operation to try and encourage peristalsis. And basically, he now found six out of the eight survived. Again, without antibiotics. So he'll express his conviction that success depends largely on source control and restoration of peristalsis. Hmm. We forget history at our peril, don't we? So if you look at the harm, the potential harm we're doing with antibiotics, there's a long list of things I can mention. I'll just touch on them very briefly because of time. So we're familiar with the obvious side effects, the rashes, the liver dysfunction, the renal dysfunction, the overgrowth with multi-drug-resistant bacteria, Clostridium difficile, fungi, You've heard Ed talk very nicely on intestinal microbiota. I've got one or two slides on that. Mitochondria, I'll mention that in a minute. They're immunomodulatory, and I'll talk a little bit about the yarish herxheimer reaction. So again, this is a nice uh, review article on antibiotic use and microbiome function. And again, it just stresses the point that Ed made that we rely on our gut microbiome for lots and lots of other functions. It's not just about sitting there. They act in synergy with us, the host, in terms of nutrition, in terms of immune protection, looking after the intestinal epithelium, metabolism, etc. And unfortunately, the antibiotics we use wipe out many, many, many of these thousand-odd species that uh, you know, live within our bodies quite peacefully. And in this article, they talk about different studies, and I'm not going to go through them in any detail apart from just highlighting the bullet points. But again, just I'll point out down the end, there is some evidence that bacterial translocation increases as a result of antibiotic treatment. So our normal flora are there to protect us against pathogenic organisms. Ed mentioned about VRE. They start in the gut and then spread. Mitochondria. I love my little mitochondria, my favorite organelle. So my, our mitochondria DNA, again, as Ed alluded to, comes initially from probacteria. And so there's a relationship. So when we give an antibiotic to kill the bug, we're also affecting our mitochondria. This is uh, probably the best paper to date. There have been a number, but came out in Science Translational Medicine a few years ago. And you can see here, they looked at a whole variety of different antibiotics, looking at six hours, 96 hours, reactive oxygen species production, and the impact of ROS damage. So carbonylating proteins, peroxidizing lipids, affecting membranes. So these drugs do have an effect on mammalian cells. These are in a Petri dish. And they also looked at mitochondria. And again, won't go into any of all the detail now, but 
Again, a variable effect on complex inhibition. This is the electron transport chain. And the ones that are more bacteriostatic have a bigger effect. ATP levels plummet, especially after 96 hours. And not surprisingly, the metabolic activity of these mammalian cells plummet. And they were using antibiotic dosing equivalent to what we're using in our patients. Okay, these were in cells, so they treated mice. And after two weeks or 16 weeks of treatment, again, the same markers of reactive oxygen species goes up, lipid peroxidation, and glutathione's an antioxidant. You can see it's depleting in response to the increased oxidant activity. Okay, these are mice. Does it mean anything to human beings? Well, it could do. The problem is our patients are already ill, so it's hard to discriminate the antibiotic effect from the underlying infection that's being treated. This is um, a nice short case series a few years ago in the New England Journal. They gave patients um, linezolid for a long period of time, and these patients developed a metabolic acidosis, hyperlactatemia, and a peripheral neuropathy. And they found that the mitochondrial function, linezolid, is a bacteria static, stops the turnover of mitochondria. They were affected. They stopped the drug. The patients got better. The mitochondrial function returned to normal. So we don't know what we're doing to our patients when we're treating them with antibiotics. Finally, I'll mention the yarish herxheimer reaction. So in 1902, they described using mercury to treat syphilis. Syphilis has come up a lot in this session. And the patients got fever, rigors, myalgia, headache, tachycardia, tachypnea, vasodilation, flushing, and hypotension. Oh, it sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? Isn't this a septic patient? And it lasted up to a day with variable severity. And it was subsequently recognized in a whole wide spectrum of infections, Lyme disease, trypanosomiasis, etc. In fact, it was uh, first described with gram-negative bacteria for typhoid fever. So patients had a lethal vasomotor collapse following the first dose of chloramphenicol. Interestingly, Yarish died of typhoid fever either because of the infection or because of the treatment, we don't know. In fact, Corin Felicol probably didn't exist in his time, actually. And it's likely related to, as they destroy the bacteria, you get this rapid release of endotoxin, which causes an inflammatory response. And so some people felt perhaps start with a lower dose rather than try and, you know, the analogy to cancer, a tumor lysis type syndrome. That's uh, one of the underlying principles of giving steroids at or before the first dose of antibiotics for meningitis. As you explode the bacteria, you release the endotoxin, you get a much bigger inflammatory response. And again, this is just a, a lab study. LTA peptidoglycans are the sort of gram-positive equivalents of endotoxin. And again, whether you use uh, bacteriostatics or bactericidals, you get a big rise in these uh, mediators of inflammation. Last uh, one minute, 22 seconds. Does it make a difference clinically? Well, I think it does. If you carry on for a long time, you're more likely to get multidrug resistance. This study uh, from the States, nine days reduced to four days, a lower frequency of MDR superinfections didn't affect mortality. This study from Spain, de-escalating, associated with lower mortality. The top panel, this is all patients. Here, patients with adequate empirical antimicrobial therapy. You'll notice it doesn't actually make a difference whether you got appropriate or not. About half the patients got appropriate. But the mortality was much better if you stopped the drug earlier. Hmm. I think there's a message there somewhere. This came out from Dan Kett, four ICUs in Florida, 303 patients at risk of uh, multi-drug resistant CAT, HAP, or VAP. And they looked to see, surely people who write guidelines must know what they're talking about. So let's see how the outcomes uh, turned out. If 
the clinicians were following the guidelines from the Infectious Disease Society of America and the American Thoracic Society. And for these query multi-drug resistant pneumonias, give dual therapy for a gram negative and MRSA cover, three antibiotics. And essentially the cover was similarly equivalent, but what did they find? Basically, if you didn't follow the guidelines, your survival rate was highly significantly better. <laughs> hmm, there's an interesting message there, isn't there? So 79% survival versus 65%, and that was even adjusted for severity. This nice paper again from the States, short course antimicrobial therapy for intra-abdominal infection, provided you do source control, Four days is as good as eight days in terms of outcomes. So you don't need to poison the patient with excessive antibiotic, provided you've got source control. This is our experience. We looked, uh, we previously published um, in about 2000, um, and then we repeated the audit over six months, 113 bacteremia episodes in 87 patients. And our practice is generally to use short course monotherapy four to five days used in two thirds of the patients. Low rates of bacteremia, breakthrough, relapse, very low rates of antimicrobial resistance and fungemia. And actually we've got better even since 2000. So very quickly, 2000 on the left column, 2012, 13 on the right, where it's colored black, it's resistant. So you can see very quickly there, community, ward, ICU on the rows. Fluconazole resistance, now we've got none in 2012-13. Methicillin resistance, now we've got no MRSA. We haven't had any for three years. VRE, a little bit there. We've only had one in the last six-month audit. And if you look at our gram negatives, virtually no multi-drug resistant gram negatives. Can you say the same? How long are you giving your antibiotics for? Hmm, I think there's an association, but call me biased. Sorry, I'm just, let's go quickly through there because I've run out of time, and I think my next slide's the uh, summary slide. Yep, so in summary, I think I've been rude about antibiotics, but I think they are still important. However, they're not the be all and end all. I don't think the impact is as great as the propaganda would have us believe. I think we don't recognize the harm. So we're offsetting a benefit with multiple causes of potential harm. So I think, yes, please do carry on using antibiotics appropriately, but sparingly. If the patient doesn't have an antibiotic, doesn't have an antibiotic, doesn't have an infection, stop the damn things. And if they do, ask the question, how long do I need to keep treating them for? And I'll finish there. Thank you very much indeed.